Where have we been thus far as we have delved into the world of Revelation? We have been looking at this letter of hope for persecuted Christian, a letter that uses symbols as to tell us something true about how we who follow Jesus make sense of persecution. And so over these weeks, we have looked at how the seven letters, the seven churches, uh, both encourage and praise those churches, but then also tell them that they need to double down on their faith and address those challenges that get in their way, that they need to learn the paradoxical truth that when you're persecuted for faith in Jesus, that is time to commit even further. We stopped for a moment to look at how did the reading of Revelation get so messed up, looking at the early church fathers and their fear that the book of Revelation would be misinterpreted, and they were right, and then looking at specifically how the last 200 years it has been misread as an attempt to form a timeline of what will happen next. We looked at the three sets of seven, the seven seals, trumpets, and bowls. We looked at how they are each uh, different takes on Christian suffering. That with the four horsemen, that they are uh, with, that's with the seven seals. That they, they are the the horrible order that evil unfolds in. We looked at the the way that. Evil enters the world through human decisions and at human invitation. That was with the seven trumpets. And then the seven bowls that was the, tells the story of the battle that wasn't Armageddon and how God's peace does not come through yet another war. All of this with the argument that uh, the continued presence and witness of Christians, even in these hard times, may lead to the repentance of others. And that's why we maintain uh, being here even in the midst of persecution. Right? So that, that's kind of where we have been. Overall, I hope that we we have established that this letter of hope to persecuted Christians is not about foretelling the exact details of what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after that. It was given to persecuted Christians of the first century so that they could know what was going to happen to them. It was given to the Christians of the years 94 and 95 in Asian Minor so that they would know that they'd still be kicking in 96 and 97 AD. And the fact that we are here today still reading Revelation is a testament to the truth of Revelation because Revelation was right. The church continued and here we are continuing to read Revelation. So instead of reading Revelation to try to break a code, to try to determine whether Vladimir Putin is the Antichrist, he's not, he is scary, but he's not the Antichrist, uh, or trying to figure out whether if there's ever a national identi identity card, if that's the mark of the beast, it's not. Uh, instead of trying to read Revelation as a book uh, that causes fear and confusion, I hope we are reading Revelation, we have learned to read Revelation for what it is, something that is much like a first century political cartoon, and that it is symbolic in almost every way. But while we are using this idea of a cartoon as a way to help us understand the book, that does not mean it is, all, it is at all funny. It is a rather serious book revealing what God has to say about being persecuted for our faith. That we will endure it if and when it comes our way. Those who are martyred will have a special reward in that if persecution does not come our way, we are to pray and support those for whom that day of persecution has come. So that's kind of where we have been. I hope you have enjoyed this as, as half as much as I have, because I've been having a blast uh, talking and preaching about and reading about Revelation. And today we could uh, continue and spend one more Sunday unpacking some of the symbols of Revelation. We could look at what we just read uh, just a minute ago in Revelation 12. Another beast shows up. There are beasts left and right in Revelation. And guess what, which, the, which beast this stands for? Anyone want to make a guess? Rome, and kind of given. If a beast shows up, it, a beast stands for a nation. This beast is Rome. It has seven heads, just like all the other ones did. Ten horns. And, and just to make sure it's crystal clear which beast this is, the horns have crowns that make diadems, crowns that let you know that these are the kings and they have blasphemous names. And yes, the kings of Rome, the emperors of Rome, had called themselves gods, so their names were blasphemous to early Christians. You're kind of understanding how this starts to work, though, right? How the, the uh, how Revelation, the symbols, they're, they're repetitive. And I'm going to confess something about reading Revelation. Once you kind of understand how the symbols work, it, it gets just a bit monotonous. I mean, the beast shows up again. Well, Rome, yeah, okay, moving on. Yeah, it, it's just kind of, it gets... John makes his point time and time again here, right? So, 
I'm perfectly willing to sit down and go through every single symbol in the book of Revelation. I will sit down with you and we will go verse by verse through Revelation, but I'm not going to do it to you on a Sunday morning. And uh, I think that would probably be better for a cup of coffee. Instead, I think what would be far more important for us to do is to try to wrap this all up. Not that we can put a nice, neat, tidy bow on Revelation. Revelation will never be neat and tidy. But what we can try to do is put Revelation in context with the other uh, things that the Bible says about the end, the proverbial it, and judgments, the life to come. We can uh, try to put this all together and, and just try to cover a, a, a coherent Christian worldview of where we're headed and how we live until that day comes. Before we dive into this, I do need to give credit to uh, John Pinkston, another pastor and a good friend of mine who uh, sort of inspired today's sermon. It was his idea to use Revelation for Lent, so uh, I owe him greatly, but uh, he, he's the one who helped inspire this. So, that's what we're going to do. We're gonna try, I'm going to try to give you the summary of what the Bible says about the proverbial it, the end, the, the judgment in the life to come. And uh, let's start with Jesus. Starting with Jesus, he tells this parable, a, design, a story designed to tease our mind. He tells this parable about being dressed and ready for action. Having your lamps lit, be like those who are waiting for their master to return so that they may be op able to open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Jesus makes it pretty clear. If you think you know when it's all going to go down, you're wrong. The act of saying this is going to be it makes it not. This comes up multiple times in Scripture. Paul's right, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians, For you yourselves know very well that the day the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You're not going to see it coming. He repeats this in uh, 2 Thessalonians. Paul tells them not to think that the day of the Lord has happened. It hasn't. Right? And notice the, the phrase, too, the day of the Lord. That's the phrase Paul uses. That's the phrase Jesus uses. The day of the Lord, if you want some nice light reading, that was a bit sarcastic. If you want to read some of the heaviest parts of the Bible, look up the day of the Lord. That phrase, it, when you, whenever you run across that phrase in, in Scripture, the day of the Lord, what you need to hear is, remember when you were growing up and you would act up and your mom would say, wait till your daddy gets home! Right? That, that's what the... What, don't, don't, you better watch out for the day of the Lord is coming! That, that's, the, that's the tone that you need to hear when you hear the day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is that time when you're going to get yours unless you shape up! Right? That, that's what the prophets are saying. All the prophets have a, a part where they talk about the coming day of the Lord. Amos is my favorite, so I'll read a bit out of him. He says, Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want... The day of the Lord. It is darkness, not light. It is the day that you flee from a lion just to meet a bear. It's the day that you flee and you run into house and you put your hand on the wall and a snake bites it. Right? That is the day of the Lord. I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Take away from me the noise of your songs, but just but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Right? Shape up. Let justice flow like waters, mercy like an ever flowing stream, or else the day of the Lord is not going to be fun for you. Right? The day of the Lord, it continues to show up in the New Testament, this way of talking about the end. When Paul talks about someone who has sinned greatly in the church, the, the advice he gives in 1 Corinthians, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit might be saved on the day of the Lord. Right? When that judgment happens. This sense of judgment continues. It's in 2 Peter that we read, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but wanting all to come to repentance. Right? The day of the Lord is held off so that all might repent. That is a gift. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. 
and the heavens will pass away, the elements will be dissolved, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness? But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens, a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Right? The day of the Lord is being held off. It is patience, so that all might have the opportunity to repent. And when that day does come, it is not that the earth dissolves, it's that... The heaven, the heaven dissolves and the earth is renewed. The earth is restored. This passage helps us understand how to live between now and that day that we are to wait and lead holy lives. This is what Jesus talks about in, as we continue that parable in Luke 12. <clears throat> when Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable for us, for everyone? And Jesus said, Who then is the faithful and prudent manager whom his master will put in charge of his slaves to give them their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom the master will find at work when he arrives. Truly, I tell you, he will put that one in charge of all of his possessions. Right? So if you want to look forward, if you want to look to the future unafraid, Follow Jesus, do his work until the day of the Lord. Be part of letting mercy and justice flow like waters until the day of the Lord comes and the new age begins and the earth is restored. Or this is what comes up again and again. Paul writes, do not, it's Galatians 6, do not grow weary in doing good uh, until that day comes, as uh, Paul describes, and again it's in Thessalonians. I do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you grieve as those who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call and the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. All right, this is the refrain of Paul. Do not grow weary in, in, in doing good, but look to this time when we will rise from the dead. Paul com repeats this in 1 Corinthians. Now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep, we, we who follow him. That death will be abolished, and that we who have, those who have died will awake to new life. All right, that, that's sort of that was a lot of scripture, admittedly, but that kind of lays out. If you want to know how Revelation fits into the rest of what the Bible says about um, the end, the proverbial it, about judgment, that, that's it. We haven't, there are some pieces we haven't touched. We didn't look at Mark 13, the apocalypse of Mark 13, and we haven't touched Daniel. You're welcome. We won't do, I won't do that to you. Uh, but... Well, I want to be clear that while Revelation is not a timeline of what happens next, the Bible has plenty to say about what does happen next. The day of the Lord is coming. There will be judgment. Right? Those who have fallen asleep will rise to this judgment. And so until that time comes, we are not to grow weary in doing the work of the Lord. Instead, seeing this time while we wait as patience and forbearance by the Lord who wait, desires for all people to repent. That day of judgment when the kingdom of God comes in its fullness, that day will come, though we do not know when. And when that day comes, the earth will be made new. Any questions before I plunge into my... Because that, that was pretty central. Any, okay, just making sure everyone's with me on that. How does that impact how we live today then? Right? We, we could talk about that for not just a few minutes, but for many hours. But just to give a short snippet, when Jesus does come, he expects us to be doing the work of healing, the work of service, the work of reconciliation. When Jesus comes and heaven comes to earth, as Revelation, Revelation describes the new Jerusalem coming down to earth, that, that's the, the imagery to have. It, we, 
heaven comes to earth, the earth is remade. We are not going to the pie in the sky when we die. We, we do not follow Jesus as fire insurance to get out of here before the earth burns. We, we follow Jesus because we are part of the great renovation project of all creation. Right? We look towards the future with hope, hope that this renovation proje- project can transform everything that we know. That in this time in which we follow Jesus, until the day of the Lord comes, we are renovating the community in which we dwell. We are renovating the family in which we are born. We are renovating and working on the land in which we live. We are to be as agents of Christ, working to heal, to renovate, to remake in his name everything that surrounds us. And we are to do it with expectant hope. The hope that the world can be remade new is not based on the hope that we're going to somehow get it all right, because we're not. The hope is based upon the goodness and faithfulness of God, which is far more trustworthy than ourselves, right? And so that is the, the way we look at this. There is a day of judgment to come, the day of the Lord. We don't know when, but until then, we are on the divine mission, the renovation project of everything that is, each other, the land, our communities, to make it whole, to make it as Christ desires it to be. And so what that means for tomorrow, tomorrow is Monday, right? Tomorrow is Monday, and if it is a Monday as usual, then our task is to follow in the footsteps of Christ and to be agents of peace, of healing, of reconciliation, to be people who go out and to renovate what is broken in creation. That is our task tomorrow. And if tomorrow comes like a thief, and that is the day, that is the day of the Lord, the fact that I just said that makes it not. But if it was to be the day of the Lord tomorrow, well, then Jesus will interrupt us, and I'm sure we won't mind. Amen.